Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in this episode, I'm honored to have researcher Jackson Pios, all the way from Australia, represent on the show to talk about his current research in the field of diet breaks for athletes. So quite a unique uh, study being conducted by Jackson at the moment, along with his review paper, which is soon to be published at the end of the year. He's investigating the role of diet breaks, intermittent calorie restriction in athletic populations. So for those of you who don't know, much of the research to date on diet breaks has been done on overweight and obese individuals. So Jackson's uh, research is the first of its kind. It's quite unique. We talk about uh, what he's doing, what the findings are, and what's Uh, approach they've taken to the research as well as uh, the differences between refeeds and diet breaks as well as how you guys can implement them for yourselves or your clients to get the most out of them to make sure that you're incinerating fats and obviously maintaining your health and strength in the gym. So I'm sure you guys will get a lot out of this episode. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel and check out Jackson's work, follow him on social media to make sure that you stay up to date with all of his latest musings and findings with the research. I hope you guys enjoy this episode and without further ado, Mr. Jackson Pios. Hey man. How you doing, bro? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. That is an absolutely kick-ass t-shirt. <laughs> Nothing better than grown men who still watch 90s cartoons, hey? <laughs> I know, man. I know my brother, uh, he is a Dragon Ball Z fanatic, so he would uh, totally appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Right. How's things with you, man? Yeah, busy. So um, the study's full on at the moment. Um I've sort of got – this week I've got another 13 coming in, but that, so that will take me up to 32 um, in the study at the moment. Um, so a whole another round of baseline testing. Um, it, it, it probably works out the same way as, as you'd structure your online coaching really, like you have a bunch of guys coming in and you're tracking what they eat throughout the week, what their body weight's doing out throughout the week, and then you're making – changes um based on that the only different element that i've got is sort of every few weeks um they'll be coming into the lab and i'll be running their bloods um looking at how the muscles are working um looking at their re energy energy expenditure and things like that yeah but yeah it's full on it's it's a lot of lab hours but um i think it's going to be worth it in the end you know yeah man for sure i think um well this is it'd have to be one of five studies that have been done on diet breaks. I think that what there, there has to be less than five. Literally. So um, before this year, there's never ever been a study that's looked at refeeding or diet breaks in athletes. It's only ever been sort of overweight Obvious, and obese yeah. people. Um, Cause obviously there's the funding issues is there. Like if, if I wanted, like when, when I first started sort of putting ideas for, um, doing a diet break re- refeed study to my board at the university, they were heavily pushing towards just doing it with obese people because we've got corporations like the NH um, RMC, which um, the National Health Research Committee, they, they can give you a hundred thousand dollars like like yeah. that, and it doesn't it's no water off their back. But trying to get money to do an athlete dieting study is so so much more difficult. Um, but the problem with, like, as you know, with, with doing research on obese people, um, they're often sedentary. Um, they often have completely different metabolic profiles to what a sort of a healthy body composition athlete um, will have. Mm. So the the amount of sort of practical application that we can take from the findings um, on obese people is fairly limited. Um, but, yeah, so going back to what I was saying, before this year um, there were none. Um now we've got the only two labs that are that are looking at sort of intermittent dieting, which is sort of can, acts as the branch of refeeds and diet breaks. The only two labs looking at that um, is my lab in U- University of Western Australia and Bill Campbell's um, University of South Florida. Um, so I'm looking at diet breaks and and he's looking at more of a refeed um, model. Um, and he's he's collected the data. Um, it hasn't been published yet, but he's he's shared the findings um, with me, so we can talk about that because I think there's a decent take home um, from that research. Um, but yeah, on, like before this year, we had nothing, um, which is kind of funny because um, people there's sort of this perception in our community that the refeeds and diet breaks are this sort of 
very scientific dietary stat- strategy that has all this evidential support behind it, and, and we just don't. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's based largely on Anecdote. theoretical rationale yeah. and, and things like that. It's like we're sort of guessing in a big mm-hmm. way. Um, like I, I'd pretty confidently say that they're a very good adherency tool. Like no one really is disputing that. But in terms of physiological benefits and reversing negative adaptations associated with dieting, um, I feel like the research is still very mixed and, and we won't know um, sort of until Bill's published his stuff and, and I've published mine. Um, but, yeah, with we, we've, we've sort of the refeeds and the, the diet breaks that are, that are getting um, used today, they're, they're based on overweight, obese data um, or just acute signaling studies that are looking at sort of um, sort of very acute hormonal changes in leptin and, and things like that. And, and as you know, like – Acute studies are fairly limited with with what we can take away from them, and we sort of need to do a chronic um, dieting study to be able to fairly confidently say what's going on. Yeah, no man, I uh, love how you skipped all the foreplay, no hey going, no introduction, <laughs> straight fucking to it, man. I love that, and I, I can just see how passionate you are about this, um, which is freaking awesome, dude. Um, but guys, this is Jackson, and as you can see, he's. Uh, He's balls deep into the research and the study at the moment, so he's not even worried about you know saying hello to people. He's just, what does the data say? What does the data say? He's straight into it. Um, but we're talking about diet breaks, refeeds today, and as you gather, Jackson's uh, at the forefront of the research, really, um, here in Australia, which is pretty cool, um, and he's looking into yeah intermittent calorie restriction. Um, you know, in athletes, which I think is, is really unique. As he said, there's not a lot of research done. Uh, most of the research is on obese and overweight people. And the way that I like to perceive diet breaks is you have to have dieted first to get a break. Um, and in many obese people, the chances are they haven't dieted, um, you know, or lost weight. So their utility is rather limited, uh, in my opinion, for, for those populations. But it's great to see Jackson doing some work uh, in a field that I'm sure is going to be relevant to many of you and your clients. So I guess let's pull things back a little bit, Jackson. When did the study uh, start? When did you, you know, obviously get all of the participants? Are you, you hooked up with Helms? Run us through uh, the process and what the objective of your study is, how it's set up. Um, yeah, I have actually seen a couple of the people that you have in your study. Um, I do know Aaron Brewer. He's one of your uh, participants, <laughs> so I know Aaron, uh, which is pretty cool. So, love shout out, man. Yeah, yeah. But no, no. I, I, I love that. Uh, there's real people, like real athletes, you know, powerlifters and physique enthusiasts involved in this study. I think that's uh, fantastic. Um, but yeah, let's strip it right back. Give us the, the nuts and bolts of the study that you're currently conducting. Yeah, so I'll go a fair bit back. So um, my original um, studies started with Bachelor of Science, majoring um, with sports science and in exercise and health. Um, After I graduated with that, I I progressed to um, an honours degree in exercise physiology. Um, And so that's a year-long degree. Um, That was when I was first started getting sort of specifically into sort of the athlete nutrition and the and the specifics of physiology um whereas sort of the undergraduate is a lot more sort of general education um but my grades during that honors year were pretty good um so when i came out after graduating um the university offered me a scholarship to continue studies um to complete a phd um and so 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 the way that happens is um you sort of linked up with some supervisors um, with sort of who are specialists in your field of interest. Um, and mine was obviously nutrition. And so you sort of have these lo- lots of meetings where you discuss potential um, research topics. And there were sort of – so when, when faced with choosing what I wanted to study, there were, there were sort of two main things that I wanted to tackle – Um, One of them was sort of refeeds and diet breaks and the other one was reverse dieting. Um, And I was particularly interested with these two because they are dietary strategies that are used very heavily um, but they actually don't have much research behind them at all. Um, So I thought there was a massive niche in, in regards to those two areas for, for um, being able to study those topics and, and to be able to learn a, a lot from them. Um, so 
a lot of meetings with supervisors um, and things like that. Um, at UWA, we haven't done a whole lot of nutrition research. So some of the supervisors were like, man, like we don't even know what a refeed is. Like you want to do like, a th- you want to th- do a three year study on this. This is pretty crazy. Like it's never been studied before. So there was a lot of resistance um, at that point. Um, but I was lucky to be put in contact with Amanda Salas, who is um, head research researcher at the Nutrition Institute at the University of Sydney. Um, I was super lucky to get that connect um, because she w- is the one of the lead authors on the Matador trial, um, which was published a couple of years ago, um, a year ago actually, which was sort of the first conclusive research that we had to show that um, a two-week diet alternated with a two-week diet break was probably more effective in terms of weight loss outcomes than a just continuous straight traditional diet. Um, so the, those pub, those findings um, with the Matador trial were pretty revolutionary. Like Now, that was with sort of overweight and obese people, but sort of Krieger was posting about it, Helms was posting about it. It was making all the rounds um, in the in the fitness community, um, even though like it was limited by the sort of the cohort that they were using. So so I spoke with Amanda and I said, listen, like we've got a massive community here in fitness and bodybuilding that are really interested in sort of the, res- the research that you're putting out. How about we sort of take it and and we – we sort of polish it up a bit and we sort of um, try to optimize some of the macronutrient profiles with the diets because that wasn't done um, that wasn't done in Matador. Um, so sort of they, they didn't really have too much care for optimizing um, fat-free mass or, or muscle mass during the diet. They didn't have too much concern for optimizing performance because these guys were sedentary anyway. Um, so, I, so I sort of I pitched it to Amanda and I said, how about we, we, we come up with this diet break study um, where we optimize the macronutrition. Um, we bring in a cohort of actually trained athletes who are already of a healthy body composition that are not overweight to begin with and see if we can replicate some of the positive findings. Um, and another, another thing that I wanted to change um, uh, or one of the things I wanted to adjust from the Matador was the Matador was a two week on, two week off. Um, so to put that in context, in context, the continuous group were just doing 16 weeks diet straight off the bat. There was a 16 week intervention, whereas the intermittent group with a two on, two on, two off, the interv- intervention dragged out to 30 weeks. Um, now, typically, like if you look at that, the research on athletes and athlete weight reduction, typically they're, they're losing weight for eight to 16 weeks. So by sort of a 30 week intervention, might turn some athletes away from it just because of the the amount of extra time required in intervention, even though it's, it's the same amount of dieting weeks. It's like if you've had a diet break, you know, it's not it's not a completely like let the dog off the leash, let your hair down sort of thing. It's still there's still a lot of control and a lot of mindful eating still in that period of time. Um, so what I wanted to know is could the same benefits on sort of um, – fat loss efficiency and metabolic rate be achieved if the diet breaks were less frequent and of less duration. So what, So instead of doing a two on, two on, two off, we're going to diet them for three weeks straight but before doing a one-week diet break, and that's the cycle that we're, that we're using for this study. Um, so that was, that was sort of the game plan that I had in my head, um, and I sort of I pitched it to her, and she said, right, well, um, she was super excited because she's only ever worked with overweight people and the idea of sort of um, advancing her findings to sort of a different niche of the population was super exciting to her. Um, but her concerns were how are we going to fund this thing? Um, because what people sometimes don't understand is every DEXA scan, every metabolic measurement, every blood test costs money and the money that you can get from the university is very limited. You get a, you get a small budget that doesn't really cover much at all. Um, so our concern was how are we going to fund this? Um, and I was lucky enough to get some support from, from Mike and Nick at RP. Um, and I'm super, super grateful to those guys because if, if we didn't have people like them, like athlete research just, just doesn't happen. Like sporting body, sporting bodies, they don't have a whole lot of money anyway. Um, and they certainly don't want to allocate their money. Um, when we're 
sort of just looking at um, a physique related outcome, an aesthetic related outcome. It's sort of sort of pitching that like to sort of say, oh, we want we want to create a diet that is going to make them feel good and, and look good. Like it's very hard to get money for that because um, sort of the um, the utility on a wider scale isn't isn't so great. Like like the bodybuilding community is quite small. Um, and the, like, I want, I want to try to, to move refeeds and diet breaks into sort of a larger sporting community. So, so sort of combat athletes, um, weightlifters, rollers and things like that. Cause I still think refeeds and diet breaks are going to be effective for them, um, because they still need to make weight for sport. They still have, um, a benefit from competing at a, at a lower body composition. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that we can sort of start um, feeding and refeeds and diet breaks to those sports as well. Um, but yeah, so th- there was there was a big funding issue, but Nick and Mike were were generous enough to give me some support there. So uh, not a whole lot of money, but but it was enough to be like, okay, we can probably probably make this work. Um, and um, so it's going to be the biggest dieting study that's ever happened in Australia um, ever. And the reason I want to do that is, is because um, what we're trying to pick up is very sensitive differences in, in fat loss and fat free mass. Um, Like to put this in perspective, um, a one kilo improvement in fat loss is practically significant for an athlete. If, if you consider that athletes will go to many, many lengths to get a 1% to 2% performance improvement. Um, but when the magnitude of change or that, that we're interested in is so small, to make that statistically different, we need a really big cohort size, um, which is why not many chronic athlete dieting studies happen because it's so daunting of the, the sort of the cohort number that you, that you'll need to, to sort of pick up statistical differences. But I sort of stuck to my guns and I was like, I, I ran the stats and, and worked out that we're sort of going to need at least 60 people. Um, and I was, I, I'd started speaking with Eric at that time. I sort of, I put, I told him what I was, what I was planning on doing. Um, and he was, he was like, yeah, hell yeah, let's do this. Um, and and he was pretty confident that with sort of his social media outreach and his connections that recruiting wouldn't be a massive problem um, because um, like when I was originally pitching this idea to, to sort of supervisors, um, when I told them I wanted to recruit 60, they were like, you're crazy. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, but thankfully, like when Eric, Eric's promo um, and a few other connects that we've got, recruiting's been pretty good so far. Right? We're already up to about halfway through our required N or, or cohort number. Yep. Um, and in terms of sort of how long the study's been going for, um, I started with my first wave about um, two months ago, um, and I've had to stagger them because I have I'm I'm doing most of the data collect by myself. I have two research assistants. Um, but it just wouldn't be possible to start 60 on day one. So I sort of need to have one wave where we bring in 15, do all their baseline testing because a baseline testing session per participant sort of takes two hours at least. So you just – and they have to be done faster before before midday. So um, I sort of going to have to stagger it through until we get the um, required number. But I'm hoping to be able to finish data collection um, somewhere halfway through next year. Dude. That's awesome. And it's uh, very pleasing to hear that uh, the guys at RP helped you out because, um, yeah, athlete studies are very hard to come by, um, but they're absolute gentlemen. So it's it's exciting, and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what the outcomes uh, are going to be. And I guess let's talk about diet breaks and refeeds and the differences between them both because – Diet breaks are pretty new on the scene. It, it may seem like they've been around for ages in bodybuilding circles, but really it's only been maybe two years that they've sort of, you know, yeah. really hit the mainstream. Uh, whereas refeeds have been a little bit longer. You know, we've had, um, you know, Lyle McDonald with his Ultimate Diet 2.0, you know, having refeeds and stuff uh, in that. Uh, the Rapid Fat Loss Handbook, I think, uh, also had refeeds, uh, all those sorts of things. So people are pretty familiar with them. But I guess, do you want to discuss on a practical level in terms of uh, the structure of a diet break and refeed, what the differences are, and then go into what the primary differences, uh, you know, physiologically uh, between them are. Yeah. So, so 
they, they don't really have a very clear and cut um, definition, but refeeds and diet breaks, they fit, um, we sort of refer to them as umbrella terms because they can sort of refer to a number of different um, dietary protocols, but they both fit with under under the heading of, of intermittent dieting. So what intermittent dieting just means is it's alternating a period of energy restriction with a period of higher calorie intake. Um, so in terms of a refeed, Typically, what that refers to is a 24 to 48 hour increase in calories coming predominantly from carbohydrate. Um, and sometimes there can be restrictions on the calories consumed during the refeed. Sometimes they'll be unlimited. And that's sort of when you're pushing more to like a, a cheat day or an ad lib feeding period. Um, you'd be surprised in how many sort of intermittent dieting studies um, in obese people where they're, instead of giving them sort of um, a refeed where they, they take them to caloric balance. They'll just tell them to eat whatever, whatever they like. That's sort of um, the way that a lot of the research goes, unfortunately. Um, but in terms of um, how athletes are typically utilizing them, um, yeah, usually 24 to 48 hour um, increase in calories, somewhere close to, to caloric maintenance or sometimes slightly above and, and predominantly coming in the form of, of carbohydrate. Um, now, a, a diet break is typically a longer um, overfeeding period and typically less frequent than a refeed. Um, so typically a diet break will be seven days or longer. Um, it's taking calories to usually um, up to weight maintenance energy requirements and often um, coming from predominantly carbohydrate as well. Um, but in turn, like for the Matador trial, which used two-week diet breaks, they sort of just increased calories. There wasn't sort of too much discrimination by where those extra calories were coming from. Now, I do think there's a strong rationale for allocating a majority of the refeed calories um, via carbohydrate, um, but it's that, that again, is, is sort of theoretical rationale. It hasn't sort of been formally tested just yet. Um, now, in terms of um, the physiological differences, um, so – there were sort of some papers that came out sort of five, six years ago, um, Chin Chance, Rosenbaum, Derlwanger, um, who, who looked at acute overfeeding with carbohydrates. And what they saw was when you feed someone on carbohydrates, you see this transient increase in leptin and thyroid circulation. Um, and, and based on this, nutritionists and coaches started speculating that, right, well, if we take an athlete who's dieted down and we feed them up on carbohydrates, we're going to get this this boost in, in leptin and, and thyroid. And what we know about leptin and thyroid is they have – positive impacts on on energy expenditure so higher levels typically show higher energy expenditure um, and we also know that leptin um, is a potent satiety signal so if you've got more circulating leptin you're less hungry and you're more able to to sort of stick to the diet so it's a sort of can be an adherency tool um, with that but when you when you sort of map out sort of the true effect of the, these carbohydrate overfeeding studies on energy expenditure over 24 hours, it sort of only translated to a 7% increase in energy expenditure or, or metabolic rate, more colloquially used. Um, so in terms of fat loss, like on a broad scale, um, it's questionable how much that increase in, in energy expenditure is really going to translate to increased fat loss. Um, I'm skeptical that it's going to be um, a significant amount, um, but we don't know. For example, um, Bill Campbell's just done a study um, at USF, hasn't been published yet, but so he's done a, a two-day refeed uh, model. So it's five days of dieting followed by a two, two-day um, high-carbohydrate refeed. And he measured leptin, um, and he saw no differences in, in leptin levels pre-refeed and post-refeed. Now, the caveat of those findings is he didn't have a very strong end. He only had sort of nine participants in that, which is is kind of a bit low when we're trying to pick up sensitive changes in hormone levels. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not totally convinced that the benefits of refeeds are totally deriving from um, this temp transient boost in leptin or thyroid for that matter, um, which is which is why I sort of I've got a much bigger cohort coming into my study and I, I am looking at leptin and I am looking at thyroid. So um, when I can, when I track those changes, 
with a bigger cohort size that we should have a better idea of, of what's um, going on on an endocrine level. Um, so so that, that's sort of the theoretical um, physiological benefits of, of, of a refeed is that you're sort of going to load up on these carbohydrates, you're going to get a transient increase in leptin they're, and thyroid, and therefore you're going to get higher energy expenditure, lower hunger levels, and then you're able to stick to the diet a little easier. Um, but I'm not totally convinced um, that that's been verified in research just yet. I think we're speculating a, a little bit. Um, but a worst case scenario, um, they're going to provide the athlete with a mental refreshment. Um, they're not going to feel so totally restricted throughout the whole dieting phase. Um, so I think it has utility in that regard. Um, but in terms of um, physiological benefits, I'm not convinced that sort of 48 hours of caloric maintenance, it doesn't matter where the calories are coming from, I don't think it's enough to, to make a significant reversal of some of the negative adaptations that are coming from the dieting. Um, I think you probably need um, a little bit longer. Um, and that's where, which leads on um, to the diet breaks, um, which essentially is so, so sort of seven days or longer at caloric maintenance. Um, and, and when we look at the research um, for, for the Matador, we see that um, compared to a continuous diet, we, saw, we see better maintenance of metabolic rate um, throughout the diet. Um, and we see greater fat loss efficiency. So what that tells us is that that a two-week diet break is probably enough um, to not completely normalize the reductions in energy expenditure that are happening happening from the caloric deficit, but enough to partially normalize it somewhat. Um, and there's another there was another study published by Davudi, I think, is where they took a group of overweight ladies and they compared a six week continuous diet versus an intermittent diet where they dieted for um, 11 days. And then they gave them a four day diet break, which is a little shorter than the seven days. Um, but again, what they saw was um, metabolic rate was able to be maintained at a higher level throughout the diet. So. It looks like when you sort of extend the period of energy balance um, to sort of four days, seven days, 14 weeks, it looks like potentially that's enough to start sort of turning back some of the sort of negative adaptations that are happening. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that diet breaks have more utility um, as a sort of as a physiological stimulus um, compared to refeeds. I just don't think two days of caloric maintenance is, is enough to sort of turn back time, if that makes sense. I yeah. think I've lost you, man. Nah, I'm here. And um, yeah, I, I think as it stands, I guess that's, that's my interpretation of the literature, um, that the benefits are sort of scaled with time. Um, mm. You know, the longer you have it, maintenance calories, uh, you know, the, the greater the you know, benefits to you physiologically. But um, as you mentioned, the, the primary benefit of either refeeds or diet breaks, you know, outside of the physiological stuff is definitely this psychological component. Um, you know, it's very much a sustainability tool because people can diet, um, they know they've got a break and it can just help them sustain, uh, you know, weight maintenance during those periods. And then if they're, you know, alternating with uh, caloric restriction, it's obviously going to lead to a net uh, you know, changing body mass over time, which I think uh, is where their biggest use uh, is. Now, yeah. in terms of, uh, yeah, continue. Um, I was just going to say, um, sort of the, the psych psychological thing um, sort of still hasn't been verified in research mm. yet, which is why sort of in my study, we've got this massive battery of questionnaires that we're getting um, people to complete sort of pre mid and post diet and and what that's evaluating is sort of something that what's called in the research is diet acceptability mm -hmm. um so the more acceptable a diet is to an athlete the more likely they are to stick to it so we should be able to see whether um a diet that incorporates diet breaks is is more acceptable to an athlete than a continuous diet and i i hypothesize that it will be but we should be able to see that shortly i, I think if you told anyone hey do you want to spend half your time eating more food? <laughs> they're, they're going to be like, yeah, hell yeah. Um, it's but, funny that you say that. They, they, there was just a, a study published sort of last year. It was sort of a weird study and it's sort of not very strong evidence. But what they did is they, they took a group of guys and they gave them this mock diet. So they, they were like it was, it was a computer-generated thing and 
that said like you're going to go on this diet and there was one group that said you're going to go on a six-week continuous diet and this is the amount of calories you're going to eat blah 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 blah. and then the other group they said right we're going to diet you a little bit harder than the other group for six days but then on the seventh day you're going to get this higher increase in calories and and they and they asked them all these questions about what what did you expect? What do you expect is going to happen? And how do you expect that you're going to feel? And they saw that with the group that were told they were going to have the, the one day refeed, they expected a whole lot more positive outcomes um, than the than the continuous group, which is, is not great evidence, but it does give us a hint that potentially that, yeah, there is something to be said for the psychological benefit. Yeah. And I think, I think it would vary markedly amongst the individual because obviously in the general population they're going to look very favorably upon eating more food if you tell them that it's going to help them whereas if you tell an athlete who potentially you know adopts a mindset and mentality where they want to work hard and they're willing to do whatever it takes um you know taking the foot off the gas could almost be contrary to how they're wired and you know what they've been working towards you know for so long and they're going to be quite fearful and potentially you know anxious around that so so I think, uh, you know, that's definitely something I've experienced with, with a lot of my uh, athletes and bodybuilders, you know, trying to, especially if they've gone from the, the bro mentality where they've got to eat clean and you're trying to obviously transition them across to a more, you know, graded approach to nutrition and, you know, bring up calories at certain points, they, they, they can be, uh, you know, quite fearful of eating more food at certain time points, especially when they've, they've mm. dieted for so long, worked so hard to, to get rid of the weight, mm. it's, it's almost counterintuitive. Um, but- it's funny. So I'll just jump in there. Um, that's actually one of the major limitations with a lot of the intermittent dieting research on overweight people is typically um, what they'll do is um, in the intermittent group, they'll get them to diet for a period of time and then they'll just say, okay, now eat as much as you like. Now, the researchers expect that they'll go back to eating normally, but because these people are in a dieting study, that they're, they're sort of their motivation for being in the study in the first place is to lose weight. Mm. So they feel completely guilty about going back to their normal eating. So they end up not actually eating to caloric maintenance or even close to it. They're still in a deficit. So sort of the findings from these some of these studies is completely limited because as we know, sort of the normalization of some of the negative adaptations associated with dieting rely on energy balance being restored. So if you're not restoring energy balance, then like the – yeah, it's. I don't expect that there'd be any benefits at all. So yeah, that's that's a big problem with some of some of the um, intermittent research. Yeah, no, for sure, that's a really good point. Um, and I guess uh, the next thing we we should be discussing is, you know, when should we look to implement uh, diet breaks and refeeds? Because like we sort of alluded to at the start, you know, um, you need to have dieted for a period of time or at least lost some weight to sort of you know warrant a break. You know, I. I uh, relate a lot of these concepts, you know, similar to many uh, training principles and, and concepts, you know, to, to have a deload in your training, there needs to be fatigue present, right? Um, there's no point having a diet, a deload if you haven't trained hard, if you've trained once a month and then you have a deload, your whole month's a deload. And I think the same can be said for diet breaks. You know, if, you, if you've been gaining weight, you don't need a diet break, um, you know, and if you're obese and, or you haven't lost any, you know, significant amount of weight, um, it's probably not necessary just yet. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of context and caveats to that, but I think as a rule of thumb, um, you know, that's, that probably makes a lot of sense. Um, Mm -hmm. so when should somebody look to implement a diet break? Because we know that, uh, you know, uh, resting metabolic rate, uh, you know, drops with, you know, 10% of weight loss. Uh, that's when we see the the biggest amount of change and then it sort of, you know, flat lines after that and it's neat that takes a hit. Uh, so should it be when we've lost 10% of body weight, we start introducing, uh, you know, diet breaks, refeeds, you know, at the moment, what's your consensus, uh, you know, on, on your findings? Um, okay. So I'm working on a review paper, um, with sort of a few heavy hitters at the moment. We got sort of Helms, Norton, um, Andy Galpin, who's a freaking genius. Um, those guys. Um, there's some, there's some big names. <laughs> yeah, man. Like a- Andy Galpin reviews some of my work, and like I'm just like, man, I am so dumb. Like <laughs> he's, he's just on another level. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're we're discussing some of these things, and and the the title of the paper is sort of intermittent dieting theoretical implications um, for an athlete. So it essentially says if an athlete was going to do refeeds and diet breaks, what sort of of um, the best way to set it up. Um, 
And research shows that sort of with men of a healthy body composition, they will lose weight consistently for at least three weeks um, when, when starting a diet. So I don't think a diet break needs to be incorporated prior to that. I think post three weeks, we, that's when we start seeing a plateau in weight loss, um, which is probably a reasonable time to start thinking about diet breaks or refeeds. Um, there's not a clear cut um, sort of recommendation yet in, in terms of, okay, lose this percent of your body weight, then start refeeding. Um, but I do think there's a very strong rationale for um, increasing frequency of, of refeeds and diet breaks as the person gets leaner. And the reason for that is is comparing sort of overweight people to athletes who are of a lean body composition. When they diet, typically the athletes will see two to three times greater protein losses. They'll see um, large reductions in testosterone and they'll see large um, decreases in fat-free mass, which is majority muscle. Um, now, when you compare that to an obese person, um, sometimes they see increases in testosterone when you start dieting them. Um, and often you, you, you see almost no change in fat-free mass because the adipose has a very protective effect on fat-free mass. So because the, the sort of the negative dieting um, outcomes of a lean person are so much more severe than someone with a higher body fat, I think it makes sense that there could be more potential utility um, for an athlete to be using refeeds and diet breaks. Um, and what else? Um, Another thing is, is as you as you progress through a diet phase, um, you get these alterations in sort of your fat and your carbohydrate oxidation for fuel. So what you'll see is is as you as you get through the diet, your oxidation of fat will decrease and the oxidation of carbohydrate will increase. So what that means is carbohydrate becomes the preferred fuel source. Now, the reason the body is doing that is because this is the most energetically efficient um, method of, of storing energy, which means it's, it's, it's a lot easier for dietary fat to be deposited straight in adipose versus glucose getting deposited into adipose, which only happens via de novo lipogenesis. And we know that sort of um, the energy cost of depositing glucose in adipose is about 25% of the nutrient excess, whereas depositing dietary fat into adipose is only 2% of the nutrient excess. So it's far more efficient and easier for the body just to take dietary fat and shovel it straight into adipose and then just burn your carbohydrates for energy needs. So what that means is um, – for a refeed or a diet break, um, it makes sense to allocate the majority of these these refeed or diet break calories as carbohydrate because if you did it as dietary fat, um, a lot of it is going to just get moved straight to adipose because your your oxidation um, fat rates are, are so so low now. Um, now another another reason for why sort of more frequent refeeds and diet breaks as an athlete gets leaner makes sense is because you get more of this um, depletion of intramuscular glycogen stores. And we know that when an athlete um, has depleted um, glycogen stores, they have increased perception of effort, um, their strength and endurance performance um, decreases, and um, they have higher perceived fatigue. Um, so it makes sense that um, when you're sort of getting to these critically low glycogen levels, having more frequent top up um, of glycogen stores via carbohydrate uh, might allow the, the athlete to just perform a little better in the gym or on the track or whatnot because they're able to, they're able to tolerate um, the higher training volumes. Yeah. So in, in summary, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't diet break or refeed earlier than three weeks into a diet. Um, but and I would start increasing the frequency of them as as the athlete gets leaner. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And in terms of how we set these up, um, you know, in terms of going to maintenance calories, because obviously a maintenance calories is going to change as we lose weight. You know, we see things drop like you know resting metabolic rate. Even if we do all the right things, you know, obviously needs going to drop. Um, you know, how are you guys in in your research papers? finding maintenance uh you know for the participants so so with the matador trial where they had sort of hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding they actually re-measured metabolic rate on a metabolic cart every sort of pre every diet break so they knew the true yeah. um rest and energy expenditure um now when we we're planning our study and I, I spoke with eric about this is 
we wanted to come up with a protocol that was able to be immediately implemented in athlete practice. Now, in athlete practice, the large majority of athletes don't have access to measurement of their resting energy, energy expenditure. So we had to think, okay, what, what other ways could we do it? So um, in my study, what we do is, is to work out their original um, weight maintenance energy requirements or the calories needed to be weight stable. We use a prediction e equation. Um, it's a quite standard one from the dietary um, reference intakes guide. And we, so we, we, we put in their, their body weight, um, their age, their activity level, and it gives us a rough marker to start, um, a, a rough estimation of what their weight maintenance um, calories would be. Now, we get the athlete to just start on that. Now, I look at their weight every day during this, during this weight maintenance phase. And if I see that their weight moves in one direction consistently for three days, three days straight, then I make a, I make a change in the calories. And what this means is, so we have, we have a, a maximum of four weeks prior to the, the start of the diet study to get the athlete weight stable. So just keep titrating their calories up and down during this four week phase until I get them weight stable. And at the, during that phase, it, because I can see, okay, their weight's plateaued now on this amount of calories, that gives me a fairly accurate reading of, of, of what their weight maintenance calories um, would be. Now, in terms of how do we adjust this um, to account for the loss of body weight, we just, we just um, at every diet break interval, we just adjust their weight maintenance calories um, based on the amount of weight that they've lost between the previous diet break. Um, and that's just through a, a, another equation. So that that's not a perfect um, it's not a perfect method because it doesn't account for adaptive thermogenesis. Mm -hmm. It's purely accounting for the loss of metabolically active tissue. But I think that in terms of being able to be utilised in the field, that's probably the best way that we could do it. Um, because yeah, in a perfect world, we'd send our athletes um, into sort of the metabolic carts to get get re get re readings done every few weeks, but that's just not going to happen with the large majority of people. Yeah, man. No, that's um, really useful to know. Um, and I think, you know, for, for coaches out there, um, you know, work out your client's maintenance calories and then during those maintenance phases, like Jackson said, keep keep a close eye on what their weight's doing and adjust up or down depending on, you know, the readings, uh, you know, based on a three-day period. But, uh, man, that that's uh, really useful. And... I guess the final question I had was, when are you going to do the reverse dieting paper? <laughs> Have you even thought that that far ahead? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I can, if I can, make, if Eric gives me the hook in the AUT with a with a ref, <laughs> with a postdoc position, then maybe. Um, but like, it's I, I think they are now that you say that. I think USF. Um, They've just started. Um, it's not a it's not a randomised control trial, but um, I think they're collecting survey data on different post comp dietary strategies, and they're going to be looking for some associations. Um, so that's going to give us a general idea um, of what's going on, sort of with the with the different post contest approaches. But like that's not extremely strong evidence. If if I was going to do it, I want to do an RCT. Um, so who knows, man? If if all things go well um, with the intermittent paper, and I can I can get some decent findings there, then then maybe I can, we can push on. Awesome, man. And Jackson, you've been uh, pretty active of late on social media. I really like your uh, PubMed uh, posts where you've taken some cartoon <laughs> with a PubMed <laughs> title and citation at the top. I think that's very clever. Um, but you're, you're all over the research and, and you're making it easily digestible for people. So where can people find you and uh, stay up to date with, with your work? Yeah, man, I, th I think some people just look for the memes. They don't actually read the, the PubMed paper, you know. <laughs> I, I agree with um, that. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I am most active um, on IG. Um, for the more nerdy crowd, um, I'm – on ResearchGate, so all my work, um, sort of published work and, and updates on the research will, will be posted there. Um, but in terms of sort of general day-to-day -day updates and sort of new research and things like that, um, I post it up on my IG. And I try, I try to sort of do a little interesting fun spin on it because I know that sort of um, telling someone to read a, a 
12,000 word RCT signaling paper um, probably isn't going to happen. So yeah, I try, I try to, I try to just take out the, uh, what I call the Chinese takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your fortune cookie. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, bro. I, I really enjoy them. So uh, yeah, guys, make sure you check out Jackson. Stay tuned for his paper. When, when are you expecting it to be done and dusted? Um, so the RCT, um, it's probably going to take a while. I think it will be published uh, next year. But we've got a re- that that review paper that I um, that I just talked about. That should be published pretty soon. I think we're we're sort of just discussing what sort of journals um, we want to head towards. Um, but I think that that review paper, a lot of people are going to get a whole lot out of that because we go hard hard into the the details of sort of right. If we're going to do a refeed, if we're going to do a diet break, how exactly should we do it, yeah. and what other things do we need to consider? So, and and that that's a that's a big paper, but it's it's loaded with gold. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of really smart dudes, a lot smarter than me on that paper. Um, so I think it's going to be a good one. And that yeah, but I'll definitely be letting people know um, when that's available to be read. Awesome, man, Jackson. Thank you very much for your time, brother. And uh, thank you, man. At least we are uh, we got you a proper send off, unlike the intro, which was just fucking bang straight into it. <laughs> man, I, I didn't even know we were recording, I thought we were just chatting. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's the thing, exactly, because people don't know the background that you know we've been sort of you know back and back and forth on Instagram and having conversations. So when I called you, like it, it wasn't unusual to me because I'm like, yeah, I totally get it, we're just picking up where we left off. Um, but then it was like, but then it was two or three minutes in, and I thought. I can't take this out. This is actually really, really good content. I've got to keep this in. So I better fucking make it work. <laughs> no, but guys, make sure you uh, check out Jackson's stuff and uh, we'll speak to you all next time. Thank you for listening. I, j- I just want to say, man, you do a hell of a lot of good for the Australian fitness scene. And uh, I think if you were doing the exact same shit in America, you'd have a whole lot of more followers. I just think <laughs> Australia is a bit slow to, to catch on to things, but um, I'm super appreciative of what you do. And I, I think we're lucky to have you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. The feeling's mutual. All right, guys. We will speak to you all next time. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel and have fun doing whatever the hell you're doing.